How you doing? I'm Bill McGee, and my wife and I had the privilege of starting Operation Smile. I'm the CEO and co-founder. Hi, Kathy McGee. I am the president and co-founder of Operation Smile. For Kathy and me, this is kind of a unique opportunity to be able to tell the world about the passion that we have for the work that we do, maybe how it started a little bit, and uh, where we're going in the future, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to invite people to join us. And uh, I think it's, it's exciting to think back because it was never planned. It was never something that we said organically, we're going to take it from here to here to there. And I think that it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to watch the myriad of people who have helped make Operation Smile what it is today. I mean, w as you look back, what's the most rewarding thing that you can remember uh, that we did? I think it was just taking that first trip because, you know, we have five little children and you say we're going to the Philippines. We had never been out of this country, 1982. Uh, you're just starting in a practice and we just made a decision, like not planning, but made a decision, we're going. And that was it. And I, I think the most important thing at that time was because of all the children, we took our oldest one with us. And that also added to Operation Smile Forever. Yeah. I think also for the people that are watching this, especially young people, is to realize that you don't have to have a, a game plan, so to speak. Um, you just have to have an idea to explore and to see what motivates you and stimulates you. Who do you meet along the way? Who has ideas that coincide with, with your passion? And as you do that, an evolution occurs in your career, no matter what it is. And for us, with you being a nurse, and me being a plastic surgeon, um, it just evolved in back and forth and back and forth, and the talents of each of ours became reality. I always like that saying we have in life there are no ordinary moments and i think we took those moments and ran with them not a plan like you're saying but you know it just seemed right it seemed like in our gut we knew this was the right thing to do yeah i also think that um, success and failure uh, a lot of people always want success but in retrospect failure teaches you more than success does it makes you sit back and say man what should I have done differently in order to move, you know, the bar forward a little bit? And with success, you can sit around and maybe pat yourself on the back, but that lasts only momentarily before the next challenge comes along. And so, I mean, I think if, if I'm forced to think about it, I think about the things that caused us to learn the most, and it was the challenges that we had. Well, yes, we had a lot of challenges, but you know, as people, people always want to be successful. It's not bad to have your failures, but in uh, 1989, 99, we did the World Journey of Hope and went around the world in uh, nine weeks, 18 countries. That, that's a vision, but who's going to make that happen? So I think just the combo of our personalities you thinking that through and my saying, okay, I gotta get my team together and have the plane has to land, the steps have to be there, the team has to be there. And we did have the presidents of countries come on that plane yeah. to know that they have so many children that they need to take care of. Yeah, I think in that first year that we went to the Philippines it was probably the one of the most powerful experiences of both of our lives. Uh, because what we witnessed in Naga City in the Philippines was literally about 300 families who had come in to seek care. And every one of the kids we saw had a gaping hole in the lip, roof of their mouth, and they couldn't eat, they couldn't speak an intelligible word. I just remember standing in the middle, there was only 14 of us in the middle and literally chills going up and down our spine, just knowing we could never touch yeah. these kids, but knowing we were capable but didn't have supplies, didn't have the people. And it was just a hair raising experience for all yeah, of us. And I can also so graphically remember that um, it wasn't for altruistic reasons that I went in the first place. I was a young plastic surgeon. I always say I'm still a young plastic surgeon. <laughs> and I just uh, wanted to get better. 
mm -hmm. taking care of kids with cleft lips and cleft palates. I had a dental degree, I had a medical degree, I had seven years of residency, and I wanted to really technically do work well, and this was a great experience. You were a lot more altruistic than I with the nursing degree, the master's in clinical social work, the master's in human development. You were much more into, oh man, these kids really need help. And it, it was it was eye-opening for me. I, I became a different person after those few weeks in the Philippines. Oh, well, I always felt that, I mean, you can do a surgery, but What's the post-op on this? Where are these kids going? Can they really speak after a surgery is done? Can they have dental work done? I mean, they need all these things. And I, I just feel like you just can't drop it at surgery. You just have to see what else has to go on yeah. to make that child hold, whole yeah. again. I, I also remember so graphically our oldest daughter, Bridget, um, 13 mm -hmm. years old, and you had taught her how to scrub before we left. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't either. Why would I take her to an <laughs> OR and teach her well, that? I, the thing is, is that in the United States, I would never be able to get my 13-year-old daughter handing me instruments in the operating room. Uh -huh. But there, there was nobody else. Uh -huh. And so she was carrying the kids in and putting them on the table and handing me the instruments uh, in the cases. And it didn't take her very long to take control of that instrument uh, table that she was, you know, taking the instruments off of. And when I reached back after, oh, a day or two to get an instrument, she said, Dad, let's get everything straight. I know where every instrument mm -hmm. is on this table. You ask me, I'll give it to you, but don't you touch my table. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I have an identity here. I have a job. I'm going to do it. Stay out of my space. And it was just not only humorous to me, but it was rewarding to see this little kid take ownership. Mm -hmm. um, well, and also she took a lot more ownership because she felt what we felt. Um, and it's hard to pass that on unless you're there and holding that child and yeah. having that mom. But she went back to her school and got a club going. And today, 30 years, 35 years later, there are thousands of students involved with our organization. It was a real blessing for both of us. You know, it, it was also a challenge in the medical community, in the, in the community that does take mission trips to other countries around the world. The idea of students being on that was pretty foreign. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget about 1985, there was a conference in San Diego that we went to, and we had all the child life specialists and the speech pathologists and the head of student programs at the time and everything yeah. talking. And half of the 200 people in the room thought it was a great idea. Half of them said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. What are you doing putting kids onto a trip? And Today, 35 years later, not only had we always believed in it, but the reality is we wouldn't be who we are today if it wasn't for those kids. They now own businesses, they now work for us, they do all sorts of things that would have never happened had we not introduced them at that formative phase of their life to the needs that existed in the world. I always say that, yeah, the first thing we do with Operation Smile is take care of a child, change a child's life. But the second thing is to involve our youth. Uh, I, I don't think any of us could be any happier than having thousands of students who know a lot more than we do today uh, to be our future. They're our future. If we don't have them, we don't have much of a future. Right. I think also you can, you know, I've watched uh, through the years, you can see all the videos you want, you can read all the books you want, you hear all the TV that you want about the needs that exist in our world. You don't really understand it until you're there, mm -hmm. until that mom or dad is coming up to you with their child who's maybe eight years old with a big hole in their lip, and all of a sudden they're saying, please take care of my child. But you have to turn away two out of every three kids because you just can't handle the volume that's coming in. Three, four hundred kids and families come at you. Mm -hmm. And man, that dilemma of saying, sorry, I can't take care of you now. And they've come, I don't know, anywhere from a mile to a hundred miles away in the dream that their child's going to get taken care of and you're saying no to them. My God, that was horrible. That was one of the most horrible moments of my life. I, I really believe it was at that moment in time that Operation Smile was born. It wasn't because we planned it in any way. Mm -hmm. It's the guilt that we felt mm -hmm. and the tears coming down our own cheeks that 
made us come back and say, what can we do? And I think that was probably one of the challenges we had then. Like, we just can't, we just can't let this go a year. I'm a mom, you're a dad, and we're going to let a child stay without speaking, without eating, and have a facial deformity for another year. So we started training. We started the education. We started getting equipment to these countries. And um, that was phenomenal because now 80% of our work are done by our locals. Yeah. I mean, it is unbelievable when you think about the transition that occurred in our own minds and in our own temperament because mm -hmm. we didn't know anything about nonprofits. Mm -hmm. We didn't know. I mean, it was just all left to us to decide how are we going to organize this, how are we going to form it. And we realized, well, you need money. You, you need people to donate to you. You need talent. You need all these different things. I, I will never forget as we left the Philippines that first year when a mom came in to, up to us with a ripe basket of bananas cradled in her arms. Her daughter at her side, maybe about eight years old with a big hole in her lip. And she said, I, I want to give you these bananas. It, it's a gift, a gift for trying to take care of my daughter, right. even though we had turned her daughter away. Mm -hmm. And all we could say was maybe next year, but we knew there was no next year. Mm -hmm. We knew the group we were with wasn't planning on going back. And so all of a sudden, we had this phenomenal guilt. We had the tears coming down our cheeks. Mm -hmm. And I think it was at that moment that Operation Smile was born because reason does lead to conclusions, but it is emotion that leads to action. And you can't be afraid of it. You can't be afraid of the emotion that you have because it gives you the energy to move forward. And I, I know that you felt that innumerable times through the years. Yeah, and there were always like sort of moments that even kind of made you think about it again, whether it was a child in the Philippines that um, gave her story to us and she was not speaking. She wanted to sing. She couldn't sing. Her mother said sing. Her friends made fun of her. She couldn't really speak. And we did the surgery and she sang for us. Full tears coming down our yeah. face. I think it was because, our 20th anniversary about that in the Philippines when we right. went back and they organized the time. And here's this little 12 year old girl that comes up and just is a beautiful singer. I mean, mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And just as charming as can be, she ultimately won the equivalent to America's Got Talent in the Philippines in singing. Mm -hmm. Her name's Chadeline, and she still today has been involved with Operation Smile. Just an incredible little kid who, at five, six years old, couldn't function in a way that would have ever given her a place in the world. I, I, that's one of the things we don't think about is, like, where are these kids? We do follow some. We do hear back from some. Uh, but... You know, when those uh, stories are presented to us, we're like, of course, that is what we're doing. We're giving kids futures. Yeah. Um, we're giving them the ability to speak. Nobody thinks, clef, 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 palate, you don't speak, you don't eat. You're, you're becoming malnourished. Nobody thinks about that. And the facial deformity is a real problem for... Well, just think of it even beyond that. What is the message that we have the opportunity to give to our world? Um, you know, our world, you know, obviously is divided. Our world is obviously not an easy world, so to speak, to live in. But mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of human beings that we've met and now, you know, in, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 countries around the world actively. Um, I don't think I've ever heard our volunteers from any place in the world talk about race or religion or culture. I think that every single one of them understands the beauty of different cultures, of different people, of the needs of different people. And when you realize you have a skill set that can help someone, you don't have to be the most decorated, you know, uh, physician in the world, nurse in the world, ambassador in the world, right. you know, mm -hmm. diplomat in the world. If you really care about what you're seeing and add your talent to that, you make a change and it is powerful. And when you see it firsthand, you can't run away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think everyone that's gotten involved has just really put their passion um, and their drive. Um, just lately, just having university students come in and demanding from us where they're going with us for the future shows the, the passion that is out there that people 
if they get involved, they can make so many changes in this world. I also think that people uh, can expect to have a regimented growth process that goes on and say, well, if I do A, then I'll get to B, and then I'll get to C. You've got to use your creativity and your intuitive understanding of individuals to allow growth to occur. And it occurs at a pace. Mm -hmm. The pace depends on your ability to sell mm -hmm. the product that you have, if you would, but also to engage people and make that theirs, to give them ownership of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason Operation Smile has grown so dramatically is because people own it. It's not you or myself or even the 300 employees that we have worldwide. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is everyday people who feel a need to help and to own it. And when that happens, I think people are drawn to it and they're the ones that make the difference. I think also just adding to that, the cultures that we have, you know, taken the ride with over the years, you know, the Philippines, Asia has a different feel than the Middle East, than Africa, than South America. Yeah. And so when we merge those personalities, it's incredible because they do come together because they know they have one focus and that is that child. Um, so it's extraordinary to, actually I, I feel very blessed that we have had that opportunity to understand cultures. And I think that's the hardest thing to do in this world today. We don't understand each other because we don't have that feeling of, okay, so you're from South America and everything is pretty happy and dancey. And, you know, that's fun to be with. And so once we merge that with even Africa, they love it. And um, all the countries in the world even love being together. Even to understand the cultures of Africa. I mean, you, mm -hmm. East Africa is so different than West Africa. Mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa is different than Northern Africa. Well, even each country of it's Africa so is different. different. The it's cultures not Africa. are so different. Yeah. And, and um, once you start to see the beauties of those cultures, it adds to your depth of understanding of the world. It adds to what you can give your country. I mean, you know, obviously we have five kids. We now have 14 grandkids. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the biggest gifts we were given mm -hmm. was Operation Smile to raise our kids. Yeah. Because how do you teach kids those values unless it's dramatic? It's tough. You get into those teenage mm -hmm. years, man, it's tough to keep your kids mm -hmm. all focused and everything. And it's not that we had a bunch of angels, which for sure we didn't. We did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. But to, to the ability to, to reach out, I mean, the story I love to tell and it still touches me is uh, we were the first Americans to go back into Vietnam after the mm -hmm. war. Sure. Back mm -hmm. in 1987, a high school friend of, of ours asked us if we would consider going into Vietnam because missing an action from the war hadn't been returned, the MIAs. And um, he said, would you consider going back? Because he knew General Bessie was the head of the Joint Chiefs under mm -hmm. Reagan. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, sure, we'll do it if we can. But we took our third child out and went to Vietnam. I went to Vietnam with him. 20 years later, he adopted a beautiful, beautiful little Vietnamese child that was left on the doorsteps of an orphanage when she was three days old, three months old when they adopted him. Mm -hmm. You know, she's added so much to our family. Oh my gosh, she's a blessing. She just is a blessing. And, mm -hmm. and would that have ever happened if we hadn't exposed Todd mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. to the Vietnam mm -hmm. of the world mm -hmm. when we didn't have diplomatic relationships till 95, about six, seven years later. Mm -hmm. It was that gift that we were given to interact with the Vietnamese that allowed a blessing to occur to our family. Yeah, I I just feel like people kind of hold themselves back from allowing their children to do these kinds of things. They're not gonna get hurt. They are gonna grow from it. And if they just put them out there a little bit more, it, it, they learn so much and they have feelings then about their future and about people. Um, I think about the, uh, we've having patients live in our house, uh, do, you know, having surgery done, some of the bigger surgeries done here at the Children's Hospital. And just the ability to have them in the house, not really knowing what's gonna happen uh, when we bring a parent or a child, we have to bring them together. And then, you know, when they have all sorts of surgery done and they have, um, 
you know, tubes coming out their nose and I say, take them to school. They are horrified that they would ever take this kid to school. And in the end, I was like, take them to school. School says, fine, go. And they were so glad they did after that because mm-hmm. that kid grew, they grew, and the school grew. Their so it wasn't just one. That's right. Their classmates really ultimately saw that their friend was stepping outside the box to do something that was good. And that's mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's just a matter of uh, there's so many things that we could talk about. Mm-hmm. There's so many examples that we could give. But Operation Smile has been a blessing to us mm-hmm. as parents, mm-hmm. as a couple, uh, as people that we work with day in and day out. Uh, because there's a common sense of family within mm-hmm. the organization we yeah. call it the Operation Smile family. Right because we're all here taking care of human beings who wouldn't have a chance otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we can see a tangible result from that that is highly emotional at times. Um, It is, and I I feel like everybody grows from it, but it's not always easy along the road. It's just, you know, you have to take steps. They're not really maybe too much time, but if you're going to make that move to change things, whether it's educating, what are the universities we're involved, where we're going to get the money, what if it doesn't happen at the right time, what if we have too many things going on and we can't address it. it, it it's a struggle during each day, yeah. where we go, what we do. It's so a, It's a fun struggle in a way. And the bottom line is we could talk about this forever. Uh, we have had the blessing of having so many experiences, but to the people that are, are listening to it or that we're you know, talking to, if you would, to realize that however they can contribute to the work we're doing carries their personality, their name, to help the children of our world and to bring our world together. And we need them. We, we yeah. could never, ever do it. And there's no one person who is responsible for Operation Smile. It's that common sense of collectivity together through the face of a child that has the ability to change the face of our world. Right, and I think the most important thing we did was listen. Like when our anesthesia said, hey guys, you do not have the right equipment. You have got to get new equipment in here. We listened. It was, you know, we had to change our ways at the moment to get that equipment, but it's safe surgery for that mm-hmm. child. That That's if there's nothing else we do, we teach safe surgery and the procedures to do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, I feel like those opportunities come along actually quite frequently. Well, as a surgeon, I can say high five to my nurse friend. <laughs> Good job. It's been fun. And we have a wonderful, wonderful group of people that are one with us mm-hmm. in the concept mm-hmm. of changing the face of our world one smile at a time. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, click that like button. And if you're new to our channel, subscribe because we put out a new episode of Behind the Smiles every other Wednesday. So we will see you then.